Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session on corporations, media, and the truth. I'm Henry McGee, a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School, and also serve on the board of directors of Tecna, a large broadcast and digital company, which owns the largest number of NBC affiliates. It's my great honor to engage in a conversation with uh, two very distinguished panelists. Uh, we have with us uh, Nate uh, Persley, who is the McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. Uh, he's also co-director of the Stanford Project on Democracy and the Internet. And importantly, he's just published a great new book I'd like to recommend to everyone, Social Media and Democracy. Uh, joining in the discussion with, uh, uh, <clears throat> with uh, Nate, Nathan will be uh, Jonathan uh, Ford, who is the chief leader writer for the Financial Times and uh, generally considered one of the smartest people in the, uh, in the business. And so what the two of them are going to uh, do under gentle questioning by me is try to answer uh, three questions. Uh, the first one is how well do traditional media outlets inform the public and help hold those with power in corporations and government accountable? We're also going to explore what is the uh, 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 what is the impact of the internet pl uh, platforms and social media on democratic discourse? And how might we think about balancing free speech with the need for truth uh, that's going to inform citizens in a, uh, in a democracy? What I, uh, in terms of the format, uh, I'm going to engage in conversation uh, with uh, Nathaniel and Jonathan for about 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, then we'll take uh, questions from the audience, if you could answer the, uh, put your questions into the Q&A uh, section, uh, those will be uh, sent up to me and we'll turn over those questions uh, to uh, Nathaniel and Jonathan. And then we're going to turn to a, a special panel of um, respondents who are uh, uh, extremely uh, distinguished. Uh, Frank Fukuyama, who's director of Stanford's Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law. Uh, joining us from uh, Harvard is Anne-Marie Lipinski, who is curator of the Neiman Foundation for Journalism. And we're going to uh, hear also from uh, Jonathan's colleague, um, Martin Wolf, who is the chief economic correspondent at uh, the Financial, uh, financial Times. Um, so uh, Nate, why don't actually uh, start with um, you. And I like to start the conversation about a recent study that you did at the uh, uh, Stanford Cyber Policy Center. Uh, you and your collaborators at the NYU Center for Social Media conducted a study that found, one, that most Americans have a very hard time distinguishing between real and fake uh, news. Uh, can you tell us about the study? Uh, how was it put together? What were the findings? And in the end, what are the implications of your study for uh, the democratic process. Sure, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, we are we continuing to do this work. So Josh, from the social media lab at NYU and I, uh, in addition to publishing that, that edit volume you mentioned on social media, you can see, we also have an ongoing series of experiments where we are sending every day three articles to professional fact checkers and to 90 average people to see what the congruence between them is. And we've been doing this for now, ooh, all, probably about nine months um, on both political stories, non-political stories, um, right-wing stories, left-wing stories. And the bottom line is, as you said, that people are not very good in distinguishing uh, true from false news in the time period where it matters, which is to say, when you have um, a, a new story that has broken and um, you worry about how the, the viral transfer of that information is going to then take hold in the population. Uh, and so, as you said, I mean, the findings are robust across every conceivable way that we, we, we've tried to tweak this, where uh, people just are, are very um, unlikely um, to consistently uh, uh, come up with the, the right answer. Um, and I should say the fact checkers also exhibit uh, quite a broad range of disagreement mm -hmm. on, on this, which is, which is also another sort of story we can talk about. But um, we've been doing this on coronavirus disinformation, we've been on political disinformation, 
Um, but, but the key thing about this study that makes it different from a lot of the others that have been tried is that we are uh, getting fresh articles every day. Um, you will find other types of studies that find people are a little bit better at this, but that's because Snopes has already done a fact check or you basically are testing people's ability to go out and find the right answer, uh, which has already been sort of fact checked. Um, but in that critical period, and, th and this is motivated really by some of the tactics and strategies that the platforms might employ in order to combat disinformation, in that critical 48 hours or so after a new story comes out, what's the likelihood that people are going to be able to discern whether it's true or false? And, and it, people are, turn out to be pretty mad at that. Um, now, you asked about what the implications are for um, democracy, and, and, and there, there's a lot, I mean, we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, uh, in, in a paper I wrote as I, I was on the Kofi Annan Commission on Elections and Democracy in the Digital Age, and, and the framing paper for that uh, commission explains what the, how the internet itself places uh, differential stresses on democracy. Fake news or disinformation is not new to the digital age, and I think that the right way to think about this is what is it about the technology itself that um, places stress on democracy? And so um, I can go into that now. I think we'll, we'll probably uh, uh, spend some time on it here. But, but in short, um, the, you know, the, the erosion of the, the intermediaries, right, who had determined uh, what was true and what was false, what was permissible and what was impermissible for an audience to hear, right, that has both that's the incredible blessing of the internet. It's also its curse, right? Um, so when we had three white guys on the evening news telling us what was um, uh, sort of what was true and what was not, that was one domain which had which excluded all kinds of voices. And now it's basically the wild west where if you want to find an opinion, a, a source of information, or lies on the internet, uh, you have the freedom to do so. And so. Um, in many ways, and I'll end with this provocative comment, the, the most democratic features of the internet are what pose the greatest threat to democracy. Uh, and so, you, you know, we're not going to be able to put the baby back into, or the uh, toothpaste back into the tube. Um, but those are, I think, the dynamics which uh, place stress on democracy. Yeah. Let, let me push you on this. Why is this, as you say, now that you don't have uh, three white guys sitting on Madison Avenue deciding what people are going to see every night. Why isn't our democracy better served by having this plurality of voices brought about by the uh, internet? As you say, there's always been uh, fake news, there's always been uh, real news, but who decides what's, new, what's, what's real and what's fake was decided by three white guys. Now it's, uh, it's the, the forum is open. That's right. And so uh, that, that is, again, the great benefit. This is not a, uh, a story, you know, in the last five years, we've, we've sort of vacillated between apocalypse and utopia in the way that we thought about the, the internet. And, you know, in short, that, that the pluralization of voices, right, the, the fact that anyone can tweet, put up a YouTube uh, video, or uh, have a blog, right, is the great benefit of the internet. It is, it is, you know, we shouldn't discount that benefit. But that then means that there are no rules as to what really uh, goes out there. Now, there are actually rules, and, and we can get into this as we start talking about the monopoly power of Google and Facebook. Mm -hmm. and, and that's another kind of feature of the internet, which is on the one hand, it's, it's the incredible pluralization of uh, voices, mm -hmm. but then on the other, it's the massive agglomeration of power in a few companies whose rules in terms of service and algorithms then determine what is going to be a uh, viral communication, what kind of information um, is uh, received. And so the, the decisions as to what goes into those algorithms and what gets prioritized then becomes uh, distortive of the Mac marketplace of ideas. And so uh, they, those, you know, the, those platforms have incredible power to determine uh, what the sort of range of political opinions that are gonna be privileged are. Yeah. You know, Jonathan, I know that you've uh, spent some time thinking about this issue and what, what it was about the construction of the traditional media business that allowed it to be uh, disrupted. And if you will, uh, uh, Nate talked earlier about uh, Google and Facebook. We'll come back and talk about that, but uh, give us your view on exactly how, we, how do we get to this point uh, so quickly and what are the implications uh, for uh, democracy for the 
uh, disruption of the uh, tr traditional media business. But, but first tell us a bit about why it was so easily disrupted. Well, thank, thanks, thanks, Henry. Um, well, well, I suppose, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what uh, Nate has said about it being both a blessing and a curse. Mm -hmm. From the perspective of, you know, the traditional media business, um, you know, what has clearly occurred is, uh, you know, it is essentially, it is, it is cursed, if you like, by an excess of competition. And the cost of publishing has simply collapsed. And, you know, the, the monopoly, if you like, the, the three white guys depended upon a kind of uh, a corporate ownership structure that um, privileged, if you like, or, or created a group of gatekeepers who were in charge of um, what was published. And, you know, one of the criticisms of the traditional media business, which I totally accept, is that it was very, uh, it was to some extent, uh, it was in some ways very remote from people's concerns. And, you know, you could argue that the public space in the traditional media business was very, had become too um, uh, sort of uh, geared, if you like, to uh, the interests of, um, you know, powerful forces, uh, corporate forces, and so forth. And, um, but, but the, the, the destruction of the, you know, the destruction of the business model is, has been, has been really brought about because of its dependence on advertising. And that advertising, as Nate has said, has flown away, flowed away largely to monopoly organizations, which do not depend on publishing per se for their revenues. And, um, and I think one of, and this has had a number of, of consequences, which have both played into, you know, the loss of revenue and also the loss of trust, um, which I think the mainstream media to some extent has experienced over the past 10, 10 to 15, 20 years. Um, I think the, the mixture of speed and declining revenues basically means that there's much less money around for editorial dis disciplines like fact checking. And, and consequently, there's the risk of more ed errors appearing in the product, which, which has consequences for trust. You know, I think to some extent, mod modern media organizations have outsourced the fact checking function to the journalists themselves. And they're expecting them also to work at high speed. And the assumption is, okay, well, it's fine because if there are errors, they'll be picked up by people outside on social media in the dog blogosphere, and that will be the discipline. But, but the consequence is the consumer discerns potentially a, a decline in quality. Um, I think the attempt to capture, recapture advertising income through you know, branded content, native advertising, similarly has uh, consequences for trust. And, and the attempt to, and, and attempting to cut costs by what, what's often referred to, certainly in the UK, as journalism, which is virtually just sort of turning around press releases and adding very little value to them, um, and sometimes leads news organisations simply to repeat nonsense, um, is once again, is a, is, a, is a degradation in the quality of the product. Um, then there's the question of, of needing to appeal to an audience in a very cluttered market, which, you know, leads to this question of sort of... Uh, um, clickbait tactics and hyper-partisanship, which, you know, if, uh, newspapers in Britain have always been partisan, but um, I think uh, in common with, uh, you know, in common with uh, uh, a lot of media and um, broadcast media in the, in the US as well, um, I think the kind of the partisanship and the willingness to just take a position which, if you like, sort of um, blows apart the tradition or just sweeps aside the traditional role of a newspaper, which was both to educate as well as inform the public, mm -hmm. um, has become very clear in many cases. And lastly, I think there's just a kind of, there's, there's been a sort of tendency to um, do things which the, you know, there was a sort of sense, I suppose, one, one, of the, one of the consequences of the kind of old gatekeeper model was that partly because there was less competition, people felt they could, or editors felt they could be more 
discriminating. They could, they could guide, the white guys could guide the people towards what they thought was correct. Now there's much more of a tendency to want to put things out there and let the market decide. Mm. And I suppose one example one can think of of that sort of tendency is uh, the Chris Steele uh, memo, which was uh, on, the, on the allegations about uh, President Trump, um, which was, uh, was a leaked document um, and was handed around and, 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 and one news organization, BuzzFeed, although it had no way of verifying this and, and uh, put it out on, in public just to say, well, you, you, the public, you, our readers should decide whether you think this is a valid um, piece of work or not. Um, so, so basically, um, so what are the implications of democracy? I mean, my view is that we, we live in a world in which my concern, I suppose, as a member of the mainstream media myself, is that we're living in a world where, as, as Nate says, it's increasingly difficult to discern what are the dimensions of, of this sort of media, of the media. Is there a, is there really a media sector? Um, and I suppose why that matters is, is that, um, you know, if the media, if if, if the, media, the, the, the media enjoyed, if you like, a, a sort of privileged position in the, in the world to hold corporations and public bodies and governments to account. And what I'm concerned about is if, those, if, that, if that sort of, if that structure falls apart or, or is, is seriously weakened, um, and you already see that in areas like local democracy where you know, local papers of a very, very, very a shadow of their former selves. It leaves gaps where there really is no obvious body. I mean, there's, there's no one step, stepping in to fill that gap and perform that function. So that's that's a concern that I would have. Yeah. Well, uh, later in the program, uh, uh, Anne Marie will tell us about what's happened in terms of the coverage in the U.S. of uh, state houses, uh, local, local legislatures, and uh, city hall, and what, 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 that's, uh, uh, what, what that's meant. But uh, Jonathan, I just wanted, you, you mentioned the idea of uh, traditional sense of corporate responsibility when it came to uh, media companies that they were run by uh, publishers who felt they had a duty to educate and uh, inform. And I'm wondering, uh, and Nate, this is for you, if you, if you believe uh, Jonathan, the, the, uh, if I've stated Jonathan's uh, premise uh, point correctly, uh, what are the implications in the United States that we have allowed our uh, two largest purveyors of news uh, to be legally defined uh, not as uh, publishers and is, is sort of uh, section 230, the uh, uh, Eve's apple in this whole thing? No, no, come here. Uh, Nate, you're, you're, you're uh, muted, I think. Can everyone hear Nate? Okay, I'll, I'll try. Uh, I was trying to switch microphones since uh, for some reason people said this wasn't as clear, but but uh, can you hear me okay now? Henry? Yes. Yes. All right, so, um, let, let me just start by dispelling some myths about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which is that the, Section 230 has become more of a metaphor for everything that ails the internet, as opposed to actually a, a, a legislative uh, fix, right? So um, if we repealed Section 230 of, of the of CDA tomorrow, that would not stop disinformation, that would not stop hate speech, that would not stop platforms from you know, maybe uh, regulating speech in a biased way. And so if you look at both Republicans and Democrats, you have a series of complaints against uh, CDA 230. Those are the, uh, the things that they worry about, right? And, and it's not going to improve the quality of information. Principally, what CDA 230 does is it immunizes platforms, and not just platforms, really any website, any, any, um, any public, not, I don't want to say publication, any my blog, as well as uh, Google and Facebook, it immunizes them from liability uh, for user generated content, right? And so principally that that's going to be dealing with things like defamation and other kinds of torts. Um, so 
So we should sort of put that to one side. I mean, the way that it and the president is as guilty as as those on the left are, uh, sort of in thinking that CDA two thirty was this incredible gift to these monopolies and that they should appreciate it by doing a better job, whatever that means, right? Whether it's regulating more hate speech or or, or otherwise. Now that doesn't mean that that we shouldn't regulate the platforms. And and so I think 230, as I said, has sort of become a metaphor for everything that ails the internet or everything that's wrong with the platforms. And so there are a lot of things we might want to do um, on antitrust, on, on privacy, on uh, content moderation. And there are a lot that, that the Europeans are thinking of doing that make a lot of sense. But we probably don't want to turn the internet into a place where every website will then be liable for user generated content because then um, there it would be very, very expensive uh, to run a website that would sort of have all the good features uh, of the internet. So, so I think that there are good reasons to regulate Facebook and Google and we should focus on those in particular. Um, but whether they're a publisher or whether they're, you know, a speaker, it's sort of like beside the point. They're not anything like a traditional publication, right? They aren't the New York Times and they aren't like a telephone service. And so we should just discard those analogies and treat them for what they are, which are you know, monopolies in the social media and information provision space. Let's deal with those problems in, you know, on their terms, means greater privacy protection, maybe greater antitrust enforcement, um, um, greater uh, regulation of, of maybe some types of content. And then you know go from there. And 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 part of that that uh, reform goal should be to try to shore up local news, to try to um, um, prevent the free riding that they do on uh, on the news industry. Right, that's a very difficult problem to solve for lots of reasons. But you could take that as as one of the legislative goals or reform goals without uh, throwing out CDA two thirty. Well, let's dig in and talk about some some uh, specifics. You, you mentioned uh, regulation. Should they let's go right to the heart of it? Are, are they too big? Should we break them up? Well, the, the, uh, I know Frank Fukuyama is, I think, going to be joining us. And Frank and I work together at the Project Democracy on the Internet. And he has a great new study on thinking about antitrust and the platforms. And I saw Luis and Gallus in the previous panel. And they, they've had a whole uh, big effort at this at the Booth School at uh, University of Chicago. Um, in some ways, it depends what problem you're trying to solve. I'm not averse to like ripping Instagram off of Facebook or WhatsApp or YouTube away from Google, but it doesn't really solve a lot of the problems that we're discussing here. So if you think the problem might be the power of Facebook's newsfeed, right? The fact that Facebook is able to organize information and use its monopoly power to essentially decide what people see. You, if you break it up, it's not, it's not gonna solve that problem. Similarly with search. Right, you, the problem is the Google search algorithm and the fact that everybody wants it, right? And that everybody is going to gravitate to it. You can take YouTube away from Google and it's not going to solve the problem. Now, there may be good kind of typical antitrust reasons to rip these companies apart um, because we fear you know, large companies that, that um, do all kinds, same thing with Amazon or, or Apple. And, and you can take sort of traditional antitrust approaches to try to separate their, you know, their, advertising arm from the um, content provision or something like that. Um, but but what Frank Frank's uh, provocative thesis is, and, and I agree with it, is that we need to think about ways of spurring other types of entities that can, um, that can basically exist as a middle layer uh, so that you could, for example, force Google and Facebook to allow different types of algorithms on their system, right? So that you would for so that you could remove their power of organizing information and to um, um, allow other kinds of companies to have access. And so if you think of, of these social media companies almost as common carriers of certain types of products, that then that's another way of thinking about the antitrust problem is to um, allow for different people to have uh, moderation uh, regimes that would be heaped onto those uh, those platforms, as well as other kinds of um, other kinds of technology. I'll say the problem here is that that is in tension with all kinds of other public policy goals. So, so for example, data protection or privacy um, is is very hard to protect if you are going to allow a lot of other firms to essentially glide on the Facebook you know, uh, right of way, right? Because the key feature, the, the thing that Facebook has and Google is the access to personal data. 
And so if you want to break up their power, it's about giving that, um, that prize possession to a larger group of companies. Right. I look, uh, that's going to be a terrific subject to explore more deeply uh, later in the uh, session. But you mentioned something uh, that, uh, Jonathan, I'd like you to jump in here on, which is uh, the free rider aspect of uh, Google and f uh, Facebook, and that they're, uh, uh, hopefully they're not treating the FT like this, uh, but they're taking the content from many uh, publications and monetizing it for themselves. Uh, that money is then being stripped away from uh, journalists' salaries uh, and all sorts of uh, bad things ensue. Uh, what's your thought on, uh, on the whole free rider issue and how, how to attack it? Well, I think it, I mean, I agree. I think it's a, it's a, it's a major problem. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, as I say, as I said earlier, it's sort of blown up a hole in in a large section of the media which to, to a great extent depended on advertising for its business model um, and most newspapers to to an extent did even if they were paid for um, i i suppose there are, there are, there are two questions i mean one is the question of whether some of that revenue can be clawed back um, from those those um, platforms um, you know there are there are lots of problems with that, and um, to do with you know um, how it gets distributed, and um, and also I, I personally I'm I'm wary of a situation where you know the, the 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 media business if you like becomes heavily subsidised by another corp commercial entity because I essentially I it's one area where I definitely do agree with. James Murdoch is, I think, the only real guarantor of independence in the media is profitability. And without that, you basically, you are, um, to some extent, you run into the same trust issues of becoming beholden to others. Um, the, the flip side of it is obviously the question of whether the, there is a, a model which, um, you know, the, the, the media can evolve, which will which will, if you like, allow it to move back to a position where it is more in control of its own destiny. And I do think, I mean, I, I suppose I, I, although I've, I, I've sort of sounded fairly pessimistic, I do think the, you know, one thing which has come out of the last few years, and particularly if you look at this year with, with COVID is the, is the sense, that, you know, certainly during the pandemic, the media has performed a very tra traditional role in a way of, acting as a sort of uh, or fulfilling its public service role of attempting to answer the public's questions about this um, pandemic, um, trying to interrogate scientists and work out what is going on and, and give advice, if you like, to the public and, and educate them. And, and, and I think that that process, um, Certainly, for some media organisations, gives the hope of, of 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 more revenue stability and and the ability to attract more people to pay. But I do think that uh, there's a large chunk of the media where that is um, that will be you know that is a fundamentally is is a more questionable proposition, and so therefore I'm I basically um, you know I think. <sighs> I think that all, to my mind, all the all the business models which people look at are have problems. Is you know, B corporations, um, not for profits. There's clearly a place for them, but they they're not going to be. In my view, it's not sustainable for the media to become a sort of not for profit zone. Um, and I think the advertising route. Yeah, it would be great if you could claw money back from the platforms in some way on an equitable basis. Um, but I think pursuing advertising dollars is itself, you know, plays once once again back into the to the fundamental problems of trust, mm -hmm. and uh, and and in this re relatively cacophonous me media sort of um, world, you know, that that trust issue is is really one of the reasons why, you know, what Nate describes as the inability of people to distinguish between false and true stories and and the fact that it is possible for um, sometimes um, 
a, a, you know, it's possible for some media actors, whether foreign or domestic, to actually, you know, actively try and muddy the pool and create confusion in the media world between what is real and what is not. Right, right. I'm a uh, reminder to the audience, we're going to turn to you for your questions in uh, just a few minutes. So uh, please put them, add them to the Q&A uh, session. Uh, but Jonathan, I want to uh, come back and take a little bit of a deeper dive because we, uh, Nate earlier talked about, sp spent some time talking about uh, platforms, which is essentially what uh, uh, Google and Facebook are. And then I'd like to distinguish between uh, platforms and publishers. And then even within publishers, there are two types of, of publishers. There's a traditional uh, publisher like FT and others, which are making a transition uh, onto into the digital space. And then there are also uh, digital natives who uh, seem to be coming with their own, the traditional media is bringing the old rules of, yep. uh, and sort of trying to bring them in. But then you have the new, uh, the digital natives, which yep. have no set of rules and you end up with the, uh, the Buzzfeed issue. Yep. Uh, let's put it out there and you decide what's true. How do you, what? How do you deal with that? I mean, what, and, and what are the implications of a whole this this whole digital native type of journalism? Well, I think you know, dig, digital natives cover a, a wide waterfront. Um, yeah. Fair the, enough. <laughs> Buzzfeed, Buzzfeed is you know Buzzfeed has its own issues in 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 creating a sustainable model. Um, I mean, I've you know. Uh, I've said they they take a certainly in 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 some area, I mean I think I actually think BuzzFeed have done a great job but um, I think they are probably bolder in terms of the way they've approached publication than a newspaper like the FT would be. Um, I think if you look at other digital natives um, which have experimented with uh, storytelling and 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 try to evolve ways of making a living you know one that comes to mind is vice which um which essentially really almost pioneered the idea of um branded content in terms of allowing advertisers essentially to um you know brand the images that they were publishing um but obviously the, 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 the trust that the user, the reader, the viewer has to, you know, has to maintain is the idea that there is some sort of church and state division between um, the editorial package and the um, person who's paying for it, who is, is obviously an advertiser. Um, I mean, I, I suppose I, I, I would say that that's the, the, the the bigger division in my mind comes, I mean, I think all, all the media, as soon as you, you become metric focused and you are competing in a very cluttered marketplace um, to get attention, you are, you're likely to, you, you, inevitably you are um, moving away from a world in, if you like the old media, the, the old media landscape where for example, people were prepared to invest very heavily in things like specialist correspondents who would acquire a very deep understanding of their sectors and, um, and the payoff would be slow and would come over time in, in a deep understanding and the ability to get exclusive stories from, from, a, from, from, from that sector or indeed investigative journalism, which is a very expensive and uh, difficult undertaking, which, which you know, I think the new media sector, um, you know, finds challenging for the same reasons that we do as a, a traditional media in, in the sense that, uh, you know, you do your 10,000 word feature and it can be summarized in a paragraph on Twitter, which is, uh, and, the, and the value sucked out. Um, but I, I suppose what I'm concerned about is, is, is the idea that, um, that, Although these media organizations are capable of doing great work and, 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 and also bringing in, um, you know, bringing in revenue which allows them to operate, although 
you know, in a, as I say, it's a, it's a comp competitive space and everyone I think is, is finding it hard to make a sustainable living. Um, there's that sort of boundary issue of where you've got the sort of cacophony, which, which Nate is talking about coming from social media, from the wider world and, and the question of, um, you know, ultimately, um, whether there is a, uh, whether we are sort of in a way kind of, um, I don't know, competing ourselves to death. We are sort of uh, the, the boundary between a, a, the, the, the media sector and, 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 and the, this, this whole ecosystem which has grown up on social media is, is very difficult for the public to perceive and really understand who fits into what. And obviously there is, a, there is another thing about that, which is of course is the more everyone gets confused about where this sector begins or ends, the more, more easy it is in a way for those who don't want accountability and to be scrutinized to simply say, well, this is, we're not interested in engaging with any of these people. We shall, we shall deal with our own communications in our own way, or we shall simply approach those organizations we like and trust. Yeah. I and have one thing there, which is that, um, what makes Facebook and Google and Twitter uh, different is that it strips away all of the um, the cognitive cues that we have in the real world that uh, are associated with veracity and progeny. So that if I go to the uh, supermarket checkout stand, right, and I see a set of publications that say Hillary Clinton involved in pizza related pedophilia scandal, right? I know what kinds of publications are there, yeah, yeah. right? Um, but but what happens in social media, because we, we've assumed that there's this thing called media, right? Which is like when, when you're in the Facebook environment or for that matter, Twitter, or even on search results, right? It's not like media is a special category that's being distinguished from everything else. So that you are essentially, you, know, you are getting a FT column or an FT, FT uh, uh, news report alongside your you know, nephew's graduation video uh, and a Beyonce uh, music video and um, you know, uh, a recipe, right? So it's all the information is then homogenized and then packaged in the same way, ripping away all the cues that we have about um, you know, the, the character of the information that we have in the offline world. Now, that, that is both um, you know, a, a disadvantageous for traditional news organizations, right? But most of what people are confronting on say Facebook, right? 95% of it is not what we would call news, right? Or, or, or journalism of any kind, right? And we, because most of the, the people who comment in this area think that, the, that most of what's happening on these social media platforms is like news in the, in, and journalism, right? We get a, a kind of biased, view about what is actually going on these platforms, but the injury still happens, which is that, I mean, the, the thing that I'm talking about where you, it becomes ever more difficult to distinguish between the FT and something else when all you basically have is the same blurb for each type of communication. Interesting. Um, I'm wondering if uh, this problem that we're talking about, uh, trying to distinguish voices and so on, uh, and bemoaning uh, the demise of traditional press is really a, um, a, a question that's uh, confined to uh, the rich world. Let me just, uh, Karthik Ramana uh, from Oxford poses this question. Uh, media seems to be uh, thriving in countries such as India with dozens of 24 by seven news channels across multiple uh, languages. Uh, is this whole issue of uh, democracy, the, 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 a broken media business model, is that strictly a, uh, a, a Western issue? Are we, are we blinded? No, it's not. It, it, okay. it applies in the developing world also. I'll just to give you a little piece of data on that. What, one of the things that Facebook experimented with now uh, two years ago was they were going to take news out of news feed. All right, so they took journalism, then put it on a, in a separate section of the site, but they only did it in six countries. Um, um, I think one was Europe or Paraguay, one was um, uh, Sri Lanka, and there were a few others. Mm -hmm. It had incredibly adverse 
consequences for the local legacy media institutions in those countries. Uh, because these were these were um, publications that had already adapted to the Facebook news ecosystem, right? And um, it you know it really did have have an impact on them. And and so all around the world, you're seeing the legacy media institutions um, uh, affected by uh, the Facebook environment. Now, in some where things are different though is that if you did not have as robust a legacy media infrastructure, the new technological environment provides opportunities, right? For a wealth of voices that, that yes. previously didn't. So if you had, all you had was state controlled media in the legacy environment, right? There's new sort of flourishing that happens all, in part because of these platforms. Now, again, this is, this is um, the, the blessing and the curse. So, so if you look at what happened in Myanmar, Right, and, and so in Myanmar, Facebook is the internet in many ways, Wait, and WhatsApp too, right? And so what, what ends up, but there wasn't as robust a, a, a set of intermediaries that had had sort of long legacies as we see in, in many of the developing worlds. So you end up with um, these platforms having even more power in those environments because their decisions about um, prioritization of information have even greater uh, impact. Uh Great. Another uh, qu uh, question from the uh, audience has to do with uh, how we sort of mo the monetization and uh, measurement, how that affects it. Um, and the questioner asks, um, do you see using user engagement as the proxy for performance in news articles leading to more uh, clickbait? And is there another way of sort of alternative way of measuring performance or the quality of the article that would uh, lead to less less distortion. Well, that is in some ways the million dollar question, which is, uh, to what extent does you said user engagement, but you, but there are other but there are different different metrics for this, right? right? Time spent on platform, right? Uh, as you say, click through rates, that kind of thing. To what extent are those metrics the ones that are being Unjustly privileged in the new media environment because uh, you know the the algorithms at, at Facebook in particular will will privilege them um, and and now no one should be under the misimpression that all the only thing that determines the hierarchy of items in your news feed is how um, titillating they are or how exciting they are right there's a lot of things that go into um, the the algorithm and it's and while it is true that in this environment it is going to prioritize those things which lead to well which lead to virality which lead to emotional engagement it's not as if that's the only thing that gets gets prioritized and you can see this with Google News and and how they measure authoritativeness uh, and the like but but I think the questioner is onto something which is that we need to figure out. Um, other kinds of metrics besides user engagement um, that will then uh, sort of balance out the, um, the, 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 the effect of that variable in the algorithm. Now, and, and so there are things, I mentioned authoritativeness before, both Facebook and, and Google um, at times will diminish the recency of an article in the in in the algorithm. By that I mean, for example, Google the 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 way that they would phrase it takes something like a crisis situation in a, like a school shooting, mm -hmm. right? They they you know these are always ripe for lots of viral misinformation. Um, the in in a crisis situation, if you search on Google for the you know is there a shooter in this in this building or something, they will not necessarily give you the most recent, the most heavily uh, trafficked articles and the like. They do have metrics of authoritativeness. We've seen this most significantly in the coronavirus in medical disinformation context. And one of the real interesting things going forward is to think about how the pandemic has completely changed the rules on social media going forward. And so you can see a direct line, I think, between the rules that were changed with respect to COVID disinformation and then how these platforms behaved in the 2020 election, right? There was a precedent that was set um, in, in the context of medical disinformation. And now they have set a bar that they are going to have to, uh, you know, clear in all kinds of other high, you know, stress situations and elections are one of them. I mean, it's raised the bar. They won't be able to put out misinformation? Well, this is, it's, it's an, so, so yes, it has raised the bar. And basically here's the way I would put it, which is now whenever, 
you know, previously they, and, and they continue to say, look, we can't be the arbiters of truth. Well, except when it comes to COVID, right? And so, so, so they have to be able to say, well, we were able to do it there, but we can't do it here, right? And so you look at what Twitter did with, with Trump's tweets, right, in the last six months, it's totally unprecedented. And, and I mean, and, and now that's gonna, are they gonna do that with Narendra Modi, right? Are they gonna start do, to, uh, that precedent, which again, a lot of the, the kind of uh, building of muscle happened when they were dealing with coronavirus disinformation. Are they going to now uh, do this and apply this across the world? It you know, remains to be seen. Right. Uh, I just, John, oh, yeah. Sorry, oh, I was, okay. was going to leap into what- uh, Yeah, please. Well, just to, just to, I, I have to say, when I, I first heard the question, I was thinking of it in a different term in terms of uh, less to do with the platforms and more to do with the decisions that media companies make and how they, uh, the metrics which they use in terms of deciding what to publish and what not to publish. And, um, it, it, you know, I mean, clearly we've moved on a long way from the era in which, which straight clicks were, were, the, were, the, were the key <laughs> metric, but, you know, measures of user engagement, length of time on article, you know, amount read and so forth, um, you know, people are constantly looking for ways in which to um, make metrics reflect quality as much as uh, interest and in, in, in public engagement. Um, but I do think there's a fundamental difficulty with, with, with metrics really governing too much editorial decisions, because I think if we come back to the question of democracy, there are things which, uh, which are important in terms of the public role of the media in holding institutions, corporations to account, which are not necessarily reflected in the immediate metrics they may generate. Mm -hmm. But, and, and, and the danger is in this sort of um, mechanistic system that those important bits of grit in the oyster get completely lost. Yeah, well, Jonathan, that goes directly to the next question that, uh, one of the attendees has uh, for you. And that is, uh, as you say, the covering important stories. And uh, she wants to know, is the, uh, the overwhelming embrace of, of social media, the rise of social media, uh, as much due by the inaction and failures of traditional media? Uh, climate change until recently was not reported as a crisis it is. Uh, the incredible lack of racial justice uh, coverage in some uh, places, uh, the list goes on and on. Is this a, uh, a, a pox that the media companies have brought upon themselves? Um, well, I think it comes back to, um, well, to be fair, I think I, I put climate, climate change to one side. I think, I think, um, I think the, 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 the media, um, I think there's been a change in over, over time in, in, in the media's coverage of climate change. And I think that's got to do with a kind of decision which was taken a few years ago that um, the idea of balance and impartiality on the question of the science was no longer really a sort of uh, viable or sensible. They, they effectively, um, you know, the science had re reached a, 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 a settled um, decision on uh, on man-made climate change. And, you know, it was like kind of trying to uh, call for balance in a football game score after the referee had blown the final whistle and the game was over. It was sort of, it was, it was, it was, and, and, and you, can, uh, you can debate over whether that should have happened sooner. Um, but I do think the other point uh, about Black Lives Matter and all that, it raises a, an important question, which the, which I do think the, 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 the kind of mainstream media has probably kind of now woken up to, but pretty late in the day, which is, you know, to some extent, trust comes from um, people, users of the product, feeling that the people who are making it share their experience or, 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 or in, some, in some way like them. This comes back to the, the white guys issue we started with. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think that, you know, for a long time, particularly the traditional media, was very full of people, a bit like me, you know, white middle class in Britain, privately educated, and we had a worldview which was pretty homogenous. And I, I and I, and I think that 
there is now a recognition that that needs to change. And certainly, at, you know, at my own newspaper, the FT, there is a, you know, there's, there's a, that is changing now. But, but I agree that it's been part of the problem is that as we've moved out of the, the old kind of top-down vertical model into a world which with much more sort of cacophonous noise, um, the media has been slow to adapt and to see that that is a kind of flank which it's exposed itself to and, and has often been, you know, uh, uh, and has been rightly in many ways attacked for that by people on social media. So yeah, I, I agree. It's, we need to, we need to, to evolve. We, we, this is not a sort of static situation. Right. Well, it's, uh, thank you. It's uh, time to uh, bring in our panel of responders and uh, Jonathan, you uh, and Nate, you'll certainly get in a discussion with uh, them, but if I, them, if I could ask uh, uh, Anne, Anne Marie and uh, Frank and Martin to turn on their cameras and join the, uh, the conversation. Great. And Henry, let me start with you. A lot, lot. <laughs> it's a lot of talk about what journalism is doing right and wrong here. What, what uh, can get your reaction to the discussion so far? Just a summary of what we're doing right now. <laughs> um, there's so much that's been um, that's been talked about here. It's hard to know um, where to start. But I, 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 I really, um, I wrote down Nate's comment about this, and I think it's been for a long time. This vacillation between apocalypse and utopia and how we think about the internet. I think that sums it up really, um, really neatly. But um, I, I have to say that I, I've been feeling, um, he also mentioned, you know, the actions that Twitter has been, ha has been taking recently. Um, but to me, it's just, um, it's so slight in comparison um, to the problem. So, um, you know, on December 2nd, the president gives that 46 minute speech um, at the White House with no audience, um, no journalists there to cover it. Um, and the coverage of it, uh, once it's posted online, which was the only place it was made available, Twitter and Facebook, is um, very critical, as you might expect, from kind of you know mainstream traditional media. I just was looking at the AP lead on the story, which talks about the president increasingly detached from reality, unspooling one misstatement after another for his baseless claim that he really won. But over on Twitter, he posts a two-minute you know excerpt of this of the speech on Facebook. The entire forty-six minute talk is posted and the only response to that by either of those platforms is you know that kind of um quiet blue ink where twitter tells you that the claims are disputed and over on facebook um, we're reminded that joe biden is the likely winner of the presidential election and um so while in fact these kinds of no notes being added in effect um not even a top, but usually beneath the president's postings, they're so, um, <clears throat> to me, they're so um, ineffectual in comparison or in, in contrast to the demagoguery um, being issued. And so this, and the word is dangerous in journalism circles, right? So the, that traditional role that journalists typically played um, not so much in gatekeeping, but in fact checking on a regular basis, the way this AP story does, is really, um, it has, was never taken up by the social media platforms. And um, I, I was working on, I was writing something about this recently and I had a recollection of being um, in the year 2000 interviewing uh, Muammar Gaddafi in a tent in Tripoli and him asking, you know, if, um, sort of fantasizing about how he could have direct a, a pipeline to the American public so he couldn't use the word brainwash. I was managing editor of the Chicago Tribune at the time and he asked if he could have direct access to our website so he could regularly post these missives to the American people. And I was thinking about this and I'm like, you know, Donald Trump is living that dream. 
that 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 is the dream, right? Um, so you're not disintermediated by pesky, you know, reporters and interviewers and and fact checkers. And so, um, you know, it's um, the, the 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 trick, though, is of course in deciding what do you do. I think it's insufficient for Facebook and 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 Twitter to say, well, we weren't designed to do that then redesign yourself to do something other than what you're doing. And if it's not the traditional role that newspapers um, have typically played, what else is it that isn't this kind of free for all and really, you know, a, a, a constant misinformation um, sort of bock and all. Excellent. Uh Martin, you uh, had wanted to uh, uh, jump in here with, with a comment on the media business. Yes, I so like Amory. I I just have so many comments. Okay, um, take it away. The floor is yours. Uh, but I won't go on too long. So I have a following comments, and I'm not going to do some great big speech, but it's an incredibly important set of issue. First of all, I think it's very important as I read your situation in the US and its comparison with ours, which is bad, but not, I think, quite as terrible, is old media still very important. And by old, I mean new old TV. My impression is that television is still very important in the US. And in that context, your decision back in the 80s, I think, which we have not taken to allow television to become propaganda stations is I think politically very significant. Um, so don't just focus on the internet. I think it's much more than that. The second um, uh, point I would make, these are in rising uh, levels of generality. I'm not gonna add to what Jonathan said about us or anything like that, um, is we seem to be moving towards a world in which we expect Google and Facebook and Twitter, I presume too, and no doubt others to come, to act as gatekeepers of authority on what is true or false. Um, and I understand why that's happening, but it does seem to me a very problematic development. I mean, it is recreating on an even bigger scale, the old, what was it, three white men uh, yeah. problem. And on a global level, and my reaction is, who the hell elected these people? So I think there's a very profound political question of, about how that should work. Um, the third question, point I wanted to make, is this constant recurrence of the, the collapse of trust. And, and I believe this is a much bigger problem than the media, though it's obviously true in the media. Um, it's a, prob a generic problem of the collapse of authority uh, in general. Um, you know, it's equally obvious that people have rejected the authority of scientists and science, which I, strikes me as a far more important and authoritative venture in the Western tradition than the media. Uh, I mean, science is what we do in the West. Um, and I think a very important part of that is uh, is quite simply the perception in our publics of a generic failure of authoritative and of what would deem to be authoritative institutions. Um, and the reason they feel they failed is because they have. That is to say, they haven't delivered what people 40, 50 years ago thought they were going to be able to deliver. Um, so we've got a breakdown of trust, I believe, for re very good reason. And my very final point is uh, even bigger. I've think, been thinking about a lot, which is, I do think what we've created, particularly with the internet, um, is, a, is a technological revolution in terms of what it does to our ability to communicate with one another and interact with one another, which is as profound, possibly even more profound than the printing press. And I've, I've thought a lot in my life about the impact of the printing press on everything. 
um, you know, little things like the Reformation and the wars of religion lasted 300 years and the scientific revolution and democracy all seem to me to have come out of the printing press, modern democracy. So I sort of think we're at the beginning of what might be a 200 or 300 year process of domesticating this stuff. And in the meantime, it's likely to be chaos and we're all going to be very bewildered. Oh my God, this is not a very pretty uh, uh, picture. But, but, <laughs> but let we, me go back. Our ancestors yeah. have been through this <laughs> and they really find it hard. But the one thing that was clear is that the world of the 15th century that certainly must have been terrified by the printing press, I mean the Roman Catholic Church, mm -hmm right to be terrified. Everything they knew and thought did indeed collapse. Right. I want to go back. Uh, you, you made a number of points. I want to uh, go circle back and talk about this issue of uh, lack of trust in, in institutions, whether that's uh, science, uh, democracy, or the, uh, or, or the press. Uh, you've had a whole career in the press. You've seen presumably over time, that trust erode. Um, what went wrong? How, 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 how did the press lose the authority and how can it get it back? Well, we live in a, I've only been in, the only press I've ever been part of is the FT. And it's a tiny little niche in terms of, uh, of the market. And I think it's about as trusted by the people who read it as it ever was. Uh, which is reasonably well. And in the outside world, it sort of doesn't really exist. Um, there is the only important change in that regard, I think, is that our, the elite who reads us has split. Um, and it's split um, essentially in the same way uh, as it has in the US. Uh, Brexit split it in us. It's that is the split between the old authority and the new uh, populist nationalism. And I think a similar thing has happened in American journalism, um, the old you know, establishment journalism, because some, some people have ended up thinking Trump is great and others haven't. Uh, but in your case, that split was already prefigured by the split between the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. So I don't think that for, for publications like that, the collapse of trust, is direct, so directly in their market. The point is that any authority they might have had beyond their market has disappeared, um, beyond their natural market. People don't think more broadly, I read it in the Financial Times, who are not readers and would never know, think that's an authoritative statement because they think the FT is part it's related to other things of that uh, that stuffed bunch of stuffed shirt people who are against us and they might be against us because we're somewhere on the populist right and hate them for that reason or we're on the uh on the woke left and we hate them for that reason so i think we have to separate in other words i'm sorry it's not an ideal answer the our market from the wider world the view of the authority carried by institutions like us. I don't think the view of our market has changed very much of us, but I think the wider world's view is publications like ours addressing that audience are not authoritative because we hate the people who read it. Yeah, Why do they hate the people who read it? Because they gave us the financial crisis, for God's sake. There's no great... Re doubt about why they should be suspicious of the people who read it. It's natural. Yeah. Well, moving away from the financial press just for a moment, Amory, what, what, what about Martin's contention that part of the whole issue here we're facing is a lack of trust in our institutions, which allows uh, people to go on the internet and decide what it is they want to uh, trust. Are you observing the same sort of lock, lack of trust in uh, traditional journalism? Um, I think that's true, yes. And I think it's true to a point, um, but just like uh, people will tell you that they distrust government, but they may like their mayor or they distrust medicine, but they like their doctor. 
Um, you know, they think higher education is a joke, but they had a professor that it's that kind of thing. And I think right, right. the same is true of journalism. Um, you know, the me media are not a, a monolith and we use that word now and it describes anything you read or hear or, or view. And that's everything from, you know, your aunt's Facebook post to, you know, the Washington Post. And um, as you talk with people, I think what you realize is it is possible for individual titles or stations or websites to build or regain trust. Um, and it's got to happen in that way. I don't think there's some omnibus gesture um, we can make that will cure this uh, for, for the industry. Um, but you do see efforts in um, both in local and national news to try to um, to try to right that ship. It is, of course, um, we know and we saw data about this again recently after the election. Um, something like fifty nine percent of uh, Democrats said they um, thought coverage of the presidential election was quite good and a considerably smaller number of Republicans said the same thing. So you do experience that national division that you see across all kinds um, of other issues. There was a um, community paper, a, a local newspaper in Ohio that closed a couple of years ago. And it was very interesting to me to see what happened there. And it was, um, there was this amazing, there was kind of a town meeting when it was announced in this outpouring of distress, of love for the institution, of people's shock, we had no idea. And you realize in a moment like that, that um, so many newsrooms, I think, are so completely disassociated from um, sort of, you know, daily conversation with their audience, except we're covering you, we're selling you an ad, that kind of thing. And I remember wondering in that case and in others like it, what would radical transparency look like in the way we talk to our audiences? And if we could achieve that, um, would there be more trust? Would that news, you know, would the town have saved the newspaper? Um, not to sound like a Gilmore Girls episode, but you know, there was a lot of conviction there um, and it was unexploited and untended. Um, in my view, by by the institution, and we need to do more of that. Yeah. Uh, speaking about the role of the of the of the press, and this goes directly to the, the theme of uh, the conference and of of this particular uh, session. Uh, and attendee has written in uh, uh, this question: uh, a lot of talk about politics and the election and uh, Donald Trump and Twitter and so on, but. Uh, What's the press doing in terms of changes coverage of both uh, corporate and, and government uh, accountability beyond uh, chasing uh, Donald Trump and his latest uh, uh, his latest uh, tweets? And has the press sort of uh, given up, uh, and particularly as, as more and more press is concentrated, has it given up its role of uh, corporate corporate watchdog? Um, I don't think so, but I do think that that um, the business coverage is just one on a long list of diminished beats in this country, at least. Um, staff sizes um, at news organizations that used to have robust business sections have been, um, you know, seriously reduced. And so, um, and they're not covering Trump either, right? They're covering like whatever the major breaking news is in their, in their communities. Um, but I do think you have far fewer watchdogs in general in most um, communities. And we really have sort of abdicated national coverage to the Times, the Post, um, the Journal, um, and, if, and, you know, a few other um, smaller publications, but who do, you know, bits and pieces of that. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm sad to say I don't see that returning anytime soon, just because there's no, nothing on the horizon that tells us that those staff sizes will increase. This goes for state house coverage, this goes for coverage of the city hall, 
um, you know, there was a newspaper in California that reduced its education staff from uh, five to one. And that one person is covering higher ed because there's an institution in that community, but no elementary or high school coverage at all. So um, I don't know how we get back to that um, short of a fairly dramatic reimagining of the economics of how we get and pay for our news. By which you mean subscription? What, tell us more about that. Um, so, you know, a lot of um, important institutions in the state, um, have models that are heavily reliant on things that journalism has not traditionally been reliant on. I mean, we don't have museums without government support of some sort. We don't have, you know, uh, symphonies without hu a huge donor base of people who are paying for more than they're um, consuming, right? They're not just buying tickets, but they're, there's a huge philanthropic um, core to those budgets. Um, journalism has never, journalism relied on advertising. Um, you know, Marshall Field stores pay for the Chicago Tribune and Chicago where I lived for many years for a long, long time, um, as did classify advertising. And when Craigslist came along, and exploded that model and classified advertising disappeared as did a lot of um, display advertising. The, the generation, you know, the multi-generational business model was destroyed. So um, do we need to reimagine it in a way that um, requires a lot more philanthropic support? Is there um, a, a, a government model government support model that both the government and journalism would see as a good thing. I have really softened on that in my, you know, in recent years. Um, news, news institutions um, took money for, um, you know, PPP recently. That was, you know, is that a government handout? Kind of. Is that something we shouldn't have done? Maybe 10 years ago, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't dreamed of it. But if it's the difference between closing your doors and serving your community or not, you think about that probably in a, in a, in a, in a different way. Um, so, I mean, the last thing I would say about that is just um, like so many things we're talking about, um, these bargains you make, like, you know, what are we gonna do about, about the internet while still holding aloft the first amendment? What are we gonna do about Facebook while still holding aloft the, the First Amendment, I think we have to ask that question about money and um, and news and who pays for it in order that we can still have that, still be a thriving democracy. It's not a small thing when the news goes away. Right. So one solution would be some sort of partnership between the fourth estate and uh, the, uh, the gov government. Um, let me turn, in, in the few minutes we have left, this has been a terrific conversation. Let, let's end, uh, let's hopefully on a, uh, uh, forward looking note. And let me start with you, uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, solutions to some of the issues that we've uh, raised over the last hour or so? How, 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 do, how do we, what do we do going forward? Well, I, <laughs> I suppose I, I agree with Nate that um, breaking up the platforms, if one's looking at the platforms as a source of some of the problems, um, breaking them up to my mind may be desirable from a from a competition standpoint, doesn't really solve these problems. Um, assuming that one does not wish to go down the route of making them more responsible for the content that they publish, which I think I would welcome, but I, I, I suspect is going to be a, an undertaking fraught with uh, difficulty. I, I mean, I, I think there is the option of taxing them uh, mm -hmm. and taxing them more heavily on the basis of, uh, of repatriating some of the revenue that from their free riding to organizations which have been deprived of it. I'm a little bit more skeptical than Anne-Marie about the idea of making the fourth estate the pensioner of the, of the state itself, mm -hmm. um, because I do think whoever pays the, the, the piper kind of calls the tune a little bit and it makes you know, subsidies, tax breaks, tax revenue can be withdrawn 
in the UK where the BBC is a state owned broadcaster, but has enormous, uh, enormously artful kind of governance structures built in which are defined, just designed to minimize state interference. Mm. You know, we have on one, almost on a daily basis, the government issuing announcements about what it might do when the BBC's charter comes wow. up for renewal wow. uh -huh. in order to yank them back into line. So I don't think that that is ultimately a, an easy solution. I think philanthropy is fine, but I just don't think it, it, it is necessarily going to support all that one would want to support. I mean, I, I do think, I, I do think the, the, the question of, I, I come back to this, I suppose I circle back always to the same question, which is, is there a way in which the media can basically um, reconnect sufficiently with its audience to, um, persuade them of the merit of that there is a virtue in paying for accurate and timely and considered information rather than a kind of soup of junk which you can pick up on the internet. And uh, I, I think that to some extent, I'm, I'm an optimist, I think to some extent, recent events have helped to make that a little bit more achievable, but I think it's a long way to go. Great. And uh, thank you. And Nate, you run an entire institute which spends its uh, time focused on this question of the internet and its uh, impact on democracy. Uh, your thoughts on how we get out of this mess? Well, to some extent, it depends which mess we're talking about here. Right. There's, there's sort of a lot of there's a lot of a lot of problems that are on the table right now, right? So, so we've got disinformation, which is one problem. We've got the loss of uh, legacy media as a as a market. Um, polarization, right? Maybe and, and and power of these platforms, right? So so these are one of the problems in in thinking about. Uh, and I'm writing a piece on the cyber agenda for the Biden uh, administration right now. Is that you know you have to understand there are trade offs, right, between each one of these things, and 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 that people don't agree on what the problem is, right? And so um, depending on who you talk to, right? You, we we've said, oh well, look at all the sludge that happens on social media. There's too much um, disinformation and the like. Well. From, from many people, right, the, the problem with, with the platforms is that they have too much power and that they are, are run by liberals, right? And that, that they are um, skewing the marketplace of ideas uh, toward the left, right? That is, that, you know, made its way into an executive order even from the president, right? Uh, following some of the actions that Twitter took. So, so there isn't real consensus on what the problem is, but, but the larger problem that Martin totally hit out of the park, and I completely agree with this, the loss of authority writ large, right? Which is not an internet specific problem, even though the internet may exacerbate that, right? And so we, we're not gonna be able to re-engineer the previous system. And all of the, any attempt that we try to do to kind of buff it up the, um, the, the legacy institutions uh, through, you know, uh, uh, charitable or, or tax dollars and the like, I think is not going to be enough. Um, the question is what kinds of new entities might be able to thrive in this environment? Um, what other new business models uh, uh, may be out there? And, and it really does remain to be seen. Having said all that, there is a lot that we can do that government can do to regulate the platforms, to try to put a thumb on the scale, um, to make a difference um, um, for one or another problem. Uh, and that, you know, written quite a bit about it. If you look at that book, Social Media and Democracy, you'll see a lot of uh, suggestions about um, what we could do with CDA 230, what we could do for things like dealing with anonymity online, something that we haven't talked about at all, which is, is a big uh, challenge to democracy, uh, trying to uh, force the platforms to allow uh, uh, competitors to have access to their data and the like. So I think there's a lot that we could do, a lot the government could do. And frankly, um, Europe will be the place in the next six months where we will see some innovation here and, and the experiments that will be coming out of um, the EU, I think, are going to be instructive as to what the U.S. should be doing. Also, however, we have a very different free speech tradition, right, in the U.S., and so there are constraints on what the government can do here that um, don't exist in many other countries. Great. Well, we've had just one. Thank you. For, we've had just one session. We have an entire conference on this. I want to thank uh, Martin and Anne, Anne Marie and uh, Jonathan and uh, you, Nate, for an incredible. Uh, uh, conversation, uh, learned a lot. And I want to bring on uh, uh, Anna, who will uh, sort of summarize things and talk about next steps.
So in terms of holding the corporations, the people in government and in the corporation accountable and where the media and the public can help, uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of work to do. And once again, it's a little catch because uh, how will the public know what it is it needs to do? So we just have to hope to uh, be able to reach and to be able to get the governments uh, to act. And Martin Wolf said it's 300 years. So let's hope it's a little bit less than that. Thank you.